If the real rather than the virtual Francis Morris was here from Tate, I would probably be an awkward bastard today, but she's not. I suspect she's watching on live stream, so hi, Francis. No. So I think I'm being compliant, and my five minutes of fame can start any minutes now. So five minutes, let's not mess about. All right, are you doing this thing? If you want me to. I don't know what to do, mate. Is that it? Yep. Okay, four and a half minutes. Okay, it's about power and rank. And they say history is always written by the victors. So are we the losers, useless eaters, non-economic, passive recipients of care? We only come under scrutiny when imposed austerity becomes the major political driver. We've been systematically exterminated, structured out, ignored and excluded as disabled people and artists. I search websites for art history. Disability arts wasn't mentioned, so it mustn't exist, right? It's totally acceptable for non-disabled actors to portray disabled people in films, but not the other way around. It's perfectly all right to commission non-disabled artists to create posters for the Paralympics. So here you go. This is called Big Ben by Sarah Morris, an American artist living in New York. It was done for art on the underground. I'm not sure how it became a poster for the Paralympics. I couldn't find it on her website. Draw your own conclusions. Missed opportunities or blatant examples of disabled artists being ignored and excluded. 30 years ago, I gave the non-disabled with their power and rank the benefit of the doubt. Not anymore. I can't accept ignorance as an excuse, and this exclusion is deliberate. Any one of the disabled artists that we all know in this room would have come up with something more meaningful than a clock. Next slide. Nothing about us without us. I remember this really well, and I thought about it. It's actually nothing about us. We remain under the radar in society and in the arts. Next slide. Arts Life Activism was the first exhibition in the new Attenborough Arts Centre curated by Aaron Williamson and Sam West up there in 2016. It was opened by the chair of the Arts Council who said, one of our ambitions is to invest in great artistic and cultural work which reflects our nation's diversity. It should have had national coverage, but the media chose to largely ignore it. Another gar gallery recently had two simultaneous exhibitions, a traditional dead artist and a vibrant exhibition of the work of disabled artists. The curator encouraged the national media to review both. They were not even prepared to enter the room to see the work of the disabled artists, never mind critique it. Will the new digital age change things for us? Are we once again in danger of being left out? I access technology to find out and search the Tate website for disability arts. Next slide. I want to make it clear, I do work with the Tate, Shape works with the Tate, and this was our Tate Exchange Ways of Seeing Art. But when I looked at Tate website, disability arts, this is what came up, 37 random items, including this painting of a man in a wheelchair being wheeled by his carer over a bridge. Next one. A photo of a one-legged man playing a banjo. Okay. Next slide. Oh, Catherine and Aaron. Okay. One out of 37. Okay. So is disability art so under the radar that the wider world either doesn't know about it or doesn't care? Should we care? It's their loss. It's not ours. Should we care that the Tate fails in its mission to increase the public's enjoyment and understanding of British art when disability arts was created and developed here in Britain? Just 37 items, mostly irrelevant, and 35 million quid annually of taxpayers' money and a mission to increase public enjoyment. Well, Tate, 12% of the public are disabled. You know, Francis, Tate are an example of the good guys, so I don't know what everybody else is doing. Now, 30 years ago, we could have called this ignorance. I think we've now got to call it neglect, prejudice, and ableism. Next slide. We will have the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive to tell our story, and disabled artists woven into the politics of the time. Next slide. So the past does need protecting and preserving and told by disabled people in first-person terms. 30 years ago, we didn't think about making history. We really just felt optimistic and had fun. And then, I think there was a dawning realization that it was wrong that disabled people face routine discrimination. 
no legislation to stop it, equal opportunities, simple really, an equal opportunity to take part in society, even though Thatcher said there was no such thing. Next slide. We sincerely thought people were getting it. Inclusion and the simplicity of the social model prevailed. Next one. Change the environment, remove barriers, stop discriminating. Next slide. The fusion of disability arts and politics was potent. Change for the better began. In retrospect, getting anti-discrimination legislation in 1995 was a win of sorts, but with it came a stasis. Since then, we've been sliding down the slippery slope, certainly through these last few, um, well, seven years actually, of Tory oppression. This year's Shape Open was prescient. It was called Power and the Politics of Disability. Next slide. Just in Piccadilly. I think it's with time we reminded them that, that we are here. Yes, I think it's important we preserve the past and we tell our stories, celebrate our difference, but let's not go soft on telling through the potency of the arts, telling exactly what's happening to disabled people right now. Final slide. Vince Laws. Thank you.